In 1982, Jim Henson and Frank Oz tried to crack the world open with the crystal, a dark crystal, if you will. And it's now time for the Geek History Lesson on Dark Crystal to begin. Hello and welcome to Geek History Lesson. I am Jason Crystallized Inman. I'm Astra Victoria Robinson. Welcome to the Mind University because you have stumbled onto the podcast where we take one character, construct, or Muppet property from popular culture and teach you everything you need to know about them in about an hour, right? Yeah, or sometimes more, or sometimes less. Usually more, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're talkers. Uh, so today we are talking about the 1982 movie, The Dark Crystal, which, of course, was directed by Jim Henson and Frank Oz because The Dark Crystal, The Age of Resistance, is coming soon to Netflix television, unless you're listening to this in the future. Then hello, future people. You've already seen it. Uh, the series, of course, will premiere on August 30th, 2019. And Ashley and I, um, well, we don't know things about dark things. We don't we don't know dark things, do we, Ashley? Uh, sure. And we don't know crystal things. <laughs> no. But we do know somebody who does. Ashley, would you want to introduce our very special guest? Okay. Our very special guest today is the writer and co-creator of Canto, which is a truly amazing and outstanding IDW comic that is in comic shops right now with art by Drew Zucker. But Drew's not here. The writer and creator of Canto is here. David M. Welcome, David. Well, hello, hello. David's also an amazing comic writer who's done other things, but Kanto is the most important right now. So that's what we're talking about. What is some of your uh, other comic? Uh, let's throw out your resume here. Yeah, your, your bona fides. <laughs> so, so I've written a couple of um, comics before this. One is a big uh, sci-fi uh, romp that I we kind of compare to Guardians of the Galaxy or Thor Ragnarok called Alien Bounty Hunter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and when that was, movie gets made, we'll have David back on the podcast. Absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, and one before that called Powerless, which is a new riff on superpowers where everybody in the world has them, but there's a few who get infected with the virus who lose their powers and uh, are outcasts and hunted down. So. We'll uh, we'll include all of this in our recommended reading so people can check out your work. Well, yeah, because uh, otherwise a recommended reading would only just be The Dark Crystal. Yeah, so. well, I mean, which is great. But, but so, can- <laughs> so Canto and Powerless will be there mm-hmm. if you want to click on them and go check them out and uh, read them. But David, we're here talking about The Dark Crystal. Now, I want to know, just before we get too deep into this, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the highest, 1 being the lowest... Where would you rank your Dark Crystal love slash fandom? I would have to say it's v- it's close to the top. <laughs> Probably about a nine. Okay, so you're like a ten. nine, nine point five? Yeah. All right, cool. Totally. So you're so this is this is the reason why we brought David on, because spoilers, everyone, I haven't seen the Dark Crystal in about fifteen years. Mm-hmm. And Ashley, have you ever seen the Dark Crystal? No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what I, could possibly go wrong? <laughs> this is gonna be great. Um, I had a roommate who named his cat after one of the horrible puppets. Which one Fizz, of the horrible? Fizzgig? The Fizzgig. cat was horrible, so I assume that the puppet is horrible. Uh, Fizzgig is the cutest little puppet. <laughs> I've seen that this. gif of him screaming. <laughs> it's adorable. It's so funny. It's so actually that, a great name for a cat. That's, uh, that's my. Well, that was a terrible animal. Uh, that's my entire exposure to the Dark Crystal. So well, we're gonna expose you some more here because. But before we get into our ten cent origin for the Dark Crystal, uh, David, we do this section on the podcast called Meet Cute, where we introduce to the, to the listeners where we first met and cuted this property. Or, you know, basically our romantic comedy origins. We stole those romantic comedies. David, I want to know, do you remember when you first encountered the movie The Dark Crystal? Yeah, so I was walking down the street and Dark Crystal, the movie, was walking toward me and we bumped into each other. Oh, and you You spilled your coffee on it. And then you slept with its best friend and then it broke (laughs) up with you. And then it showed me Fizzgig and I was in love. No, I'm not going to convince you guys to love Dark Crystal. I'm going to convince you to love Fizz Gig. Okay. Um, no, I was three years old, um, almost four years old, when uh, Dark Crystal first came out in December of 1982. So I didn't see it quite then. It 
was a little dark for a um, almost four year old, mm-hmm. but I see I saw it multiple times when I was growing up, and um, I guess the meat cute was that it was it it terrified me so much. I mean, it didn't terrify me. It just was so unsettling. It was almost like as a kid, it's one of those movies that you watch that. It's it's scary enough that you think that maybe you're defying authority mm-hmm. to watch mm-hmm. it or to sit there as an eight, nine, ten year old to experience this. And you're kind of looking out of the corner of your eye for your parents to come into the room. Um, so that's kind of how I experienced the Dark Crystal when I was young. Nice. All right. Well, the 10 cent origin. Ashley, what's that? That is where we tell you all the basic who's it's and what's it's and creators in case you go to an amazing uh, Dark Crystal themed cocktail party and someone doesn't know what it's about. The Dark Crystal is a film that is directed by Jim Henson and Frank Oz. It was produced by Jim Henson and Gary Kurtz. Screenplay by David O'Dell was a story by Jim Henson and it was released on December 13th. 1982. Now, the movie, the official synopsis of the movie is on another planet in the distant plat, excuse me, on another planet in the distant past, a Gelfling embarks on a quest to find the missing shard of a magical crystal and so restore order to his world. And David, you said that you have the official synopsis for the new Netflix series. Let's just go ahead and throw that one out there because it's a prequel as well. But we'll, we'll, we're not going to talk about that one until towards the end of the lesson. So what is the official synopsis of the prequel? Sure. I'll just preface it by saying that, um, you know, you watch the movie and it's one of these fantasy movies where they don't really build out a lot of the lore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They just drop you into it. The, well, well, there is there is information about what was going on in, in this world, but they don't. It, there's a lot of seeds there that never get that never grow into anything um, after the movie is over. So the official synopsis for the Netflix series is: the world of Thra is dying. The crystal of truth is at the heart of Thra, a source of untold power. But it is damage corrupted by the evil Skeksis, and a sickness spreads across the land. When three Gelfling uncover the horrific truth behind the power of the Skeksis, an adventure unfolds as the fires of rebellion are lit, and an epic battle for the planet begins. So you can definitely see when Jason, you you read the 1982 synopsis mm-hmm. for the movie in this, it's very 2019 synopsis. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big. It's like, we got to throw that character in there. We got to have that inciting incident. We got to have that hook in there. We got to twist it. Yeah. The fires of rebellion. Yeah. You can hear the announcer. Back in the 80s, it was just like, yeah, a movie with a sword. Yeah. <laughs> well, one of the fun things about the movie, um, sort of sort of the background and what was going on behind the scenes in the movie is there were audiences... So what so Henson would go out on these press junkets to promote Dark Crystal, and he would get questions constantly. So where are the Muppets? <laughs> what? <laughs> where are the Muppets in this movie? Because nobody, I mean, up till then, he had done the Muppet Show, which was mm-hmm. extremely popular. Um, the first Muppet movie came out that he produced but did not direct. And then the second, The Great Muppet Caper. I love The Great Muppet Caper. <laughs> well, he that was actually the first film that he ever directed. Mm-hmm. Um, so those two came out and Dark Crystal was sort of pushed down the road because of those two movies. Um, so when he was doing the press junket for Dark Crystal, that's what everybody was coming off of. I just can imagine, hi who I'm here for the Dark Crystal. <laughs> <laughs> and a, a, another fun fact about that is they made sure that Frank Oz and Jim Henson did not do voices for the Dark Crystal because they didn't want, like, Jen. Crossover. Well, they didn't want Jen, the main character, who was... Um, uh, Jim Henson was the actor mm-hmm. who who um, worked the puppet. Uh, they didn't want he didn't want anybody to think of Kermit because <laughs> that's basically just his voice for the, for the most part. <laughs> All right, so David's already dropped this in here, so we're in the history one hundred and one section, and this geek history lesson is going to be a little bit different. So David's going to give us a lot of information and you a lot of information about the Dark Crystal, and basically by the end of this, we sort of had a, a twist on this episode before. Ashley and I are going to decide. Whether or not we're going to rewatch, or for me rewatch, and actually watch for the very first time the original Dark Crystal movie, yes. and then lead right on into the series. Now, uh, David, I'm already intrigued by this movie, but I'm already a little confused by this movie. In case somebody doesn't know, is so this movie's puppets 
are is it only puppets or are there humans in it too? The, there are no humans in this movie. So it's an all puppet movie. It's an all puppet movie, and Henson actually decided that he wanted to do an all puppet movie. Um, he his third movie he directed was Labyrinth, and uh, people who are close to him said later on that he specifically said. I want humans in Labyrinth. We're not doing the Dark Crystal again with all puppets. Um, <laughs> yeah, so so uh, he set out. He wanted to do something. He, he had this fantasy idea. He wanted to create this world. Um, and he actually started with the world and the visuals before he started with the story. So the story was kind of a secondary thing that came on with the uh, screenplay and that sort of thing. And I think, you know, I love the movie and I love rewatching the movie. But if there is one thing that I think modern audiences might take from it, it's that the story is a little bit um, secondary to the visuals and the character Mm -hmm. designs and that sort of thing. Yeah, but you know what? That goes over really well because we have 900 Transformers movies and that's the same sort of thing. So I think maybe a modern audience... Well, I was actually might be more warm to that than we would hope. I was going to say that's uh, actually a similar theme to many anime that yeah, I have been told true. by many listeners of this podcast to go yeah, check out that the visuals are stronger than the story. Jason has an ongoing battle with anime. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, let me ask you this: Is there? You keep bringing up the visuals. Is there? Has anybody ever done an art book on the Dark Crystal? Surely they have. There is a tie-in comic. There is this, like several, several comic series. I will series Google that. Probably this, put you on the bus on that one. Uh, okay, so you're telling me about the visuals of this world. This is not set on Earth. Tell no. me about this world. Okay, so it's set on this planet, Thra, um, and about a thousand. So, going way back, there is this crystal that was installed in this world that um, sort of brings balance to everything. And about a thousand years ago, there were these entities called the Urskex, U R S K E K. S? God, I love fantasy names. <laughs> well, so yeah, they're called the Earth Urskex, and um, the crystal sh- uh, shatters, cracks, mm-hmm. and a, a shard of it uh, separates from the main crystal, which causes these Urskex to divide into their good side and their bad side, but two separate entities. This is Sailor Moon. Like Sailor Moon is very like with crystal imagery as well. Sailor Moon was created later in a different part of the world, um, but it's kind of that same idea, which I think is very interesting. Uh, by the way, there is uh, there are several uh, dark crystal art books. They're available on Amazon. I'll knock those into the recommended reading too. Let's <laughs> just make them make this recommended reading huge, man. Right. As big as a dark crystal. Um, okay, so this 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 shard. Split off. Split off. Is this shard the dark crystal? What? Is, what okay, the, the dark crystal is the crystal itself, but it goes dark because it's the crystal of truth. All right, cool. That's where I was concerned with. I was and, like, what is this dark crystal? And it goes dark because the shard is missing, and these Urskex divide into the Skeksis, which are these mm-hmm. evil vulture, crocodile, um, just hideous creatures that adorn themselves with these regal, opulent clothing and robes and uh, jewelry and all these things to cover up their like twisted bodies underneath. Mm-hmm. And there's actually a scene in the movie where one of them gets exiled, challenges another to the new um, seat to be the emperor, and he gets exiled. And the way he gets exiled is that the other Skeksis rip off all the robes. And so you see this like twisted, gross vulture, skinny vulture thing um, without any of the clothing and you see why they cover themselves up because they bulk up and they sort of hide all this strange mm-hmm. body that they have. And then the other, the flip side, the good side is, uh, they're called the mystics in the movie. Um, they're, they're called Uru, U-R-R-U. So the Urskex are the Skeksis and the Uru now. Mm-hmm. Um, and they go off in some distant place and sort of start forgetting about what happened. And these are the, the, the elf-like puppets, right? Uh, no, th- those are the oh. Gelfling. Oh, my bad. Sorry, my bad. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. so that's the third race. So a thousand years ago, the crystal split. These two Skeksis and Uru now um, exist in two separate entities. Um, then there is a prof... This is all pre-movie. So this is all backstory. Okay. Um, then there's a prophecy that this Gelf... These little elf This things, is what will be covered in the Netflix series, I hope. <laughs> well, yeah. So so about 200 years before the events in the film, the Skeksis 
um, learn of a prophecy that a Gelfling is going to reunite the shard with the crystal and which would cause the Skeksis to lose their rule over the land and basically have these good and evil sides reunite into these single entities, single mm-hmm. creatures. Um, so about 200 years before the movie starts, the um, Skeksis create these cre- these crab-like creatures that go and um, basically commit genocide against the <laughs> now, Gelflings. Uh, these aren't these crab-like creatures like from the, uh, the brine people from the Aquaman movie, is it? Um, I'm trying to remember what they look like because these are like big round shells. They almost look like giant horseshoe crab type Mm -hmm. things, um, that walk around and they have these, they have this weird sound effect that they use. It's like a little skittering and they have these legs that, um, very visually very cool. Um, yeah. So they send them out and they, they kill all the Gelflings, but the two main characters in Dark Crystal, Jen and Kira, um, are secreted away as little Gelfling babies. And Jen is raised by the Uru, the mystics, the good ones. And Kira is raised by these little creatures called the um, podlings, which mm-hmm. are kind of the most Muppet-like. They look like um, potatoes with faces, basically. <laughs> is it, is it, I'm going to Google these is, now. <laughs> is it a later reveal? I remember, um, is it Jen? I remember Jen being raised by the the, the mystics. The mystics. Mm-hmm. I remember a bunch of those scenes. Now, I want to ask you because I don't honestly remember. Do they separate these kids, these two Gelflings, because they know that they could be the prophecy bringers? Is that the idea? No. So, no. so the um, Gartham are the crab creatures, right? Mm-hmm. So when they attack, it's Jen's parents and Kira's parents both hide the babies away. Mm. So everybody, all the other Gelflings, get killed. Um, And so these two babies are the only survivors, but the Skeksis Ah, don't know they exist. Very uh, Moses slash Superman. Podlings do look like potatoes. That's the most perfect description. Well, I can't take credit for it because I I read something where they were creating them. They're like, yeah, they just look like potatoes. They're so cute, though. They look like the uh, the grandma that you want to be making you soup. (laughs) Yes. So So every so we have these two Gelflings. And, you know, this is a very fantasy story. We know that something's going to activate these two Gelflings to go on their hero's journey. So what what is the thing that gets these two characters out of their zone of comfort? So Okay, we're getting real writerly. <laughs> I mean, this is, I mean, we're, I mean, it's the best way to describe it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it becomes a hero's quest. So Jen is raised by this mystic who is kind of the head of the mystics. There's only um, 11 or there are only 10 that uh, remain of both the Skeksis and the Mystics. And the the head, I guess the head mystic, I forget what they call him in the movie, but um, tells... Merlin. Dumbledore. <laughs> Dumbledore. <laughs> Gandalf. Mer- Merlindor. Um, yeah, so, so he tells Jen, just on his deathbed, he tells Jen there is this prophecy that a Gelfling is going to reunite the shard with the crystal, and it has to happen before the three suns next align, the great conjunction, or the Skeksis will rule, the evil Skeksis will rule forever. So now you have, in riderly speak, you have your ticking clock, <laughs> you have your hero's, your reluctant hero's quest, his mentor dies, mm-hmm. which pushes him out into the world. And so he has to go on this adventure to find the shard. And then um, it's a really interesting thing, um, plot plot choice in the movie because he knows he has to go get the shard but nobody tells him what he has to do with it so it's something that he discovers later after he gets the shard um and he does that by i don't know i mean i guess spoiler alert it's been out for i think 30 i mean we're years. in full spoiler territory yeah, for this yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so he, he goes out he finds the shard and um then he, they eventually very conveniently I would say. Well, children's movie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, they find these ruins that were, that used to be a Gelfling like settlement basically. Mm-hmm. And they look on the wall and they learn that the Gelfling, the prophecy says the Gelfling is going to return the shard to the crystal before the great conjunction to stop the Skeksis from ruling forever. That's it. Not even like a particularly dated trope because Kong Skull Island literally does the same thing. Where they stumble upon this ancient civilization, and there's wall paintings that tell them what to do next. Well, and it's and, it, and they 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 create it. I mean, the question is why did the, why didn't the mystic that was mentoring Jen and raising Jen why didn't the mystic just tell him that's he needs mm-hmm. to go find the shard and then put it in the crystal? 
And in the opening sort of voiceover narration, they actually say that the mystics have sort of fallen into forgetfulness. Mm. And then they're, when this all starts happening, they're called to take this very slow trek back to the castle where the Skeksis live, which happens, which they end up there just about the same time that the movie is at its climax. So um, it's, there's a lot of moving parts that eventually end up coming together and maybe a little bit convenient ways, but also it's perfectly acceptable for me for this movie. I also want the listeners to know that uh, David is a good hand talker like Jason and I, and he's making the most beautiful gestures that nobody but us will see as he's describing the events of this movie. <laughs> well, okay, I think... I will do it in interpretive dance as well, if you'd like. Please do. <laughs> so, so, yeah, we know the adventure. We know a lot of stuff like that. Um, I don't know. Again, many people have seen this movie. Many people probably are going to watch this movie because of the Netflix series. So I don't know if I want to give away the ending. I, I, let's just let's not give it. Let's save. We don't know what they. I think we can. I think we can figure probably it out. figure. You know. Um, right. Yeah. So it's a. Yeah, I mean, it's a quest, but uh, you know, it's go in and experience it. I would. I would encourage everybody to go and experience it because it's beautifully done. Especially in 1982, like when I come back to this movie, I put myself in the mindset of 1982 going into the theater, having never seen a movie with practical puppets like this from start mm-hmm. to finish. And there's moments where they show the Skeksis really um, sort of skeletal, leathery hands, and they have movements on it. There's one right in the opening scene, the Skeksis take sort of their life essence from the sun reflecting off the crystal. And there's this one moment where one of the Skeksis, ugly, like beak-like face, there's um, this these like beams of light from the crystal going into its eyes, and it's totally still. But then you watch its throat, and you actually see how it almost looks like it's it's breathing, or it's like subtly mm. drinking in and it's like those very subtle movements that's what I mean that's my hard sell for this movie <laughs> it opens with this absolutely stunning shot of th- like the tundra mm-hmm. in Thra and it's got this uh, castle that's this dark thing with spires and points on it. it almost looks like a twisted tree there's um dark clouds with lightning um and in they're sort of moving and roiling and then there's these um pulses in the ground of light that sort of feed into this castle and it's the very opening moment of this movie and then i actually wrote down um i took a note on what the uh opening lines were and it's the narrator in this desolate land with this castle, it says, another world, another time, in the age of wonder. And I'm sold. And I'm sold right there. The Henson Company needs to hire you to write their uh, press releases, because that was a beautiful description. <laughs> I mean, it's just, and it, you know, it's the, the moment you step into this world, you're, you're there. And then they show the Skeksis, and they are just these twisted, you know they're puppets, but they're so twisted that you sort of just can't look away from them. And then it's... an it's supposed to be like fairly for fairly young kids, mm. um, and it's it's dark. Mm-hmm. It's super dark. But see, that's the thing. Like, ki- that's the thing that has been. I don't know. I don't want to say corrupted, but has been changed about modern. Is that parents don't think kids can handle dark subject matter and. I just want to be like, do you remember Bambi when we shot Bambi's mom in the first <laughs> fifteen minutes? It's fine. Like, like kids can handle dark stuff because dark stuff exists in our world. And I think to hide kids from dark stuff is the wrong way to do it because then they grow up and they're, you know, they're, I mean, they're Casper they're, the Ghost. Yeah, they, they're they, sort they, of they, sheltered. Yeah, they don't know what to do. Um, all right. So I want to ask you a question, David. Um, and then I'd love to hear because I know you prepared some fun facts for uh, the Dark Grizzle. But I want to ask you a question specifically about... The Netflix show, okay, which we literally know nothing about, mm-hmm. um, but a very awesome friend of ours, uh, Ted Basili, who is a listener of the show, uh, has a, I know had a piece to do with this. Um, very excited to see what the show uh, becomes. As a Dark Crystal fan, you know the movie, you know it, you you know you've loved this movie for so long. What do you feel? What do you want to see? Like, what do you really hope they do in that show? So the movie, I feel like the scope of the movie, even though it was, uh, you know, saving the world, um, the world of Thra, it was still very much focused on Jen and, and his journey 
and Kira when he when she joins him. Um, I would I I know the show. It's going to be ten episodes. Um, I know the show is going to be set with the events leading up to the Great Gelfling, the the Gartham War and the Great Gelfling Purge, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I want to see, and it's these three Gelflings are the main characters. What I want to see is some way that they set it up that it's really about these three Gelfling. We know what happens if all Gelfling are exterminated by the time the movie starts. We know by the end of the series, they're going to be gone. Mm-hmm. So we, I, I want to see... Unless that's season five. Yeah. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I mean, they do have 200 years, I think, between when this show starts and when the movie starts. Mm-hmm. Um, but I want to see, I, I would love to see a very uh, personal journey, that very specific reasons why these three Gelfling are the ones that want to go and save, mm. other than saving their people. I mean, that's that's always a really laudable laudable goal. It's like underselling yeah, yeah, it yeah. majorly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But the idea being that they have really specific reasons why they are the ones of all the Gelfling to go out and save Save, try to save their people. Which is, uh, that's sort of the Rogue One question of it all. It's like, well, we know what's going to happen to these people, so you have to convince us to like them or else They're, the stakes are pretty low. Right. Which can be tough. Yeah, well, it'll be interesting to see basically the world that happened in the prologue of the movie. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that's, again, that's always the problem with prequels is when we know what happens. The Hobbit's the same way. Exactly. Like, what do you do to make us care and I think you you nailed it like uh, going on the characters all right so I want to hear some some dark crystal fun facts okay fun facts <laughs> all right so I think Henson started developing the story the, the seeds of the story in about 1978 um, it was eventually based on a 25 page story he wrote um, while snowed in at an airport hotel oh. believe it or not. <laughs> He hired an um, artist named Brian Froud, F-R-O-U-D, uh, t- because he loved uh, his fantasy paintings in this book called Once Upon a Time. Uh, and and I, th- I saw some visuals from that back then, mm-hmm. and they look very similar to um, the mystics. Oh, cool. So Henson was really drawn to that. And I think when he brought Froud on, he sort of let him – he was involved in the process, but he let him – Develop the visuals and the world and the characters, um, sort of on not on his own, but he gave him the the um, driver's seat in doing all of that. That's really interesting because to circle all the way back to when you brought up like where are the Muppets? Because like I consider all hens and puppets to be Muppets, and the Dark Crystal is the group that feels the most separate from Kermit or Ernie or what we think of as being a classic Muppet. I have a theory uh, for why you think that. Okay. I think it's because they look the most human. Yeah. Like they're the, the most realistically re- The like, Gelflings are gorgeous. They, they, look, they, they have like human noses. They yeah. look the most human. Mm-hmm. Right. Totally. Um, and actual skin tones. You mean green is a skin tone? <laughs> I, I think early on they wanted uh, Jen to be, he wanted Jen to be blue. Oh. That feels very, a uh, very Henson move to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. eventually they went back to sort of the skin tone. <laughs> there you go, Ted. There's an idea for season two, Blue Gelflings. <laughs> um, so I think we mentioned earlier that Henson had directed The Great Muppet Caper, which was the second mm-hmm. um, film. And then um, he directed, co-directed The Dark Crystal with, with Frank Oz, who had never directed a movie before. Um, and he had some really interesting commentary <laughs> later on about how that all went. He loves he loved working with Henson. Mm-hmm. Um, I Frank think- Oz went on to a luminary directing career, by the way. Uh, Little Shop of Horrors, uh, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels with Michael Caine and uh, Steve Martin, which is an amazing film. What About Bob, which is a very funny film. And also one of my favorite comedies of all time, Bowfinger, starring Eddie Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen that movie? Um when did it come out? Uh, two early two thousands. Okay, but it's about maybe. I'm gonna I'm gonna pitch you on Bowfinger. This is gonna be a <laughs> Bowfinger episode. Convince uh, me, Jason. <laughs> so Steve Martin is a washed up writer director, and he has no money to make anything, and he gets like ten thousand dollars. Luckily, I can't remember exactly the, but he gets ten thousand dollars, and so he's like, "This is my last shot." And so what he decides to do is dress up as a. Uh, a woman? No. Uh, oh, that's Tootsie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what he decides to do is that Eddie Murphy plays like the most famous actor in town, and Eddie Murphy turned down his movie. 
And so what he decides to do is to hire an Eddie Murphy impersonator and then just catch the real actor, like paparazzi style at certain things, and then make a movie based out of the footage. And uh, it works. <laughs> and the movie is about him like piecing together the most <laughs> cheapest. And is it really funny? It's it's a I think it's a very it's a hilarious movie. Like um, I don't know whether this scene would hold up to modern standards, but um, he of course needs a film crew. Um, he drives down to the border, opens up his van, and and waves people oh. inside. <laughs> you know? So I don't know if that Maybe scene. A little up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? Let's yeah. assume they worked under union standards, so it all yes, worked out. They, okay. they, they, well, they they become actually amazing DPs by the end of the movie, but. There's a funny scene where um, he forces the Eddie Murphy impersonator, played by Eddie Murphy, to uh, cross a freeway for an action scene. And watching him cross the five is very <laughs> is hilarious. Um, uh, Bowfinger, underrated classic, but we're talking about Dark Crystal. Oh, and, but I will say one of my favorite movies of all time was Little Shop of Horrors. Yeah. So... Did they when you when you said it was interesting? Did they find they butted heads because they were both in charge for the first time, or what did what did you mean by that? Or what? so some of the comments that I was um, that Frank Oz uh, made later in interviews and things that I read was more about him. He sort of felt like back then um, he everybody would go to Henson with questions and they would sort of view him as the the captain of the ship. Mm-hmm. And even though Oz was doing the co-directing, mm-hmm. he was not getting those kind of questions or that kind of respect from from everybody on set. And so he even said this himself that back then he felt very sort of put out by that and you know maybe he didn't make the best choices and do the do the things the way he would do now based on those kind of feelings. Um but he says that's all you know, he feels very differently. I admire you know. when people can be honest about those experiences and being like, that's the way I felt at the time and it wasn't meant that way. And now uh, now I've grown from that. Also, um, I empathize with how Frank Oz feels. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. This is, this, is a, this is a commentary we're going on here. This um, is going to get really awkward really fast. I, I just want to point out, just in case our listeners don't know, because there might be a few out there. Frank Oz is the voice of Yoda, everybody out there, in case you don't and know that. Piggy. And Miss Piggy. That's my favorite fact um, about Frank Oz. And he's, and he's, and he's now an award-winning filmmaker, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> director. Which is amazing. Look, we, amazing. We should all be so lucky to have the creativity Frank Oz has in his yes, pinky. Yeah, he's yeah. amazing. So I think Frank Oz actually actually um was led to yoda because of dark crystal or at the same moment because um he feels yoda feels very of a piece with this world actually with, uh, there's this character in dark crystal called agra mm-hmm. and she is an astronomer and she's she's short and she's stout and she has a very yoda-esque um speech pattern mm-hmm. would you call her proto yoda Proda. Proda. Yeah. Um, well, it, it, maybe I think this in well, eighty two. It was before. Well, um, it, it, Empire, right? Empire, well, Empire's eighty. So, uh, oh, so this. So, was so the interesting, but they 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 probably were making this around or developing this right. around the same idea. I had always heard the story that that George Lucas wanted Jim Henson for Yoda. And Jim Henson was like, I'm too busy. I can't do it. But you know who you should get is Frank Oz. Now, if this fits in with everything else, I would say that he was probably too busy with making the Dark Crystal. I think so. And, and that's that um, jibes with what yeah. I've I've read. Um, so I th- Lucas and Henson sort of had this mutual respect. Um, and Henson ended up working on Empire uh, for Yoda to help develop Yoda. And it's... Um, and Gary Kurtz, who is a who is the producer on uh, Star Wars, and he came over and produced the Dark Crystal. Mm-hmm. And one of the really interesting things I read was uh, Henson went over to uh, George Lucas and Empire to learn more about filmmaking. So it was kind of this mission before Dark Crystal, and the Star Wars folks thought it was fantastic because they learned about puppetry and what Henson was doing and some of the things that they used on Yoda they eventually adapted to use in the Dark Crystal. So it's like this mutual relationship where they're both getting something out of it in an area that they're it's not their expertise. And then Collaboration if, yeah. over competition every time. All the times. And then if you track that forward 
then that tells you that they were so impressed with Yoda and maybe so impressed with what they saw in the Dark Crystal. That explains why the beginning of Return of the Jedi is Puppet Palooza Truly. in Jabba's Palace. Uh, with Jason's <laughs> favorite character of all time, Salacious Crumb. Salacious Crumb. <laughs> Salacious Crumb. <laughs> I mean, it's, I, that's, that's second for me. The first one is Salacious the mouse. Salacious B Crumb, by the way. Uh, is B? <laughs> yeah, what does the B stand for? I Jason? have no <laughs> idea. They don't, they've never said but Butthead. Head. His official, was that official? His official name is Salacious B Crumb. I love that. <laughs> I want that for him on a business card. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he's second to um, the mouse droid for me. That's my favorite. Aww. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mouse droid. He's so cute. Um, a few more fun facts. Uh, so, the way that the Skeksis and the Mystics were puppeteered, you had one puppeteer who would um, have an arm in, like, up over his or her head in the head of the character. And then the other arm is working one of the character's arms. And you'd have a second actor inside working the other arm arm of the character. Because the Skeksis are huge. If our listeners haven't been able to see the Jim Henson exhibit, um, they're they're like people-sized big. <laughs> right, and the Mystics are really hunched over, and um, Jim Henson said that he never wanted to create puppets that he couldn't puppeteer himself. He would never ask actors to do that. And he said, he, there's um, a comment I, I read where he would get inside and he could only hold up the mystic's head with his arm for five to ten seconds. That's how heavy these puppets were with the radio control animatronics in their faces mm-hmm. and all these other things. Um, the uh, Gartham, which are the crab-like creatures, <laughs> were so heavy that the actors, they actually hung the, the puppets themselves on racks so the actors inside could have a rest from it being from them being rested on their shoulders on their harnesses that's how i mean it sounded like the whole production was super brutal um was also crazy too because i imagine that at the time because i would imagine now we have enough plastics and foam and materials that just manufacturing is improved 3d print well i i I just make it much lighter right Mm -hmm. we could make it like we could do the same suit but it would yeah it would lay like it would it would weigh like half or or, or even one third of the cost but like back then i imagine there was like okay we can only make this out of two things yeah whereas now it's like well we have like 10 different materials we can do you know of course most people would say that well now they would just do it cgi and mocap it but you know if you were to actually make the puppet nowadays i think it would be lighter the show i mean the 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 netflix show is doing all traditional puppetry yeah which is great i think traditional effects are the bomb you can see that in the trailer that's the one thing i liked about the new netflix show trailer is that those puppets again there is there's there's a look to Mm -hmm. reality look real they they look real there's a weight i think um yeah that's that's i don't don't even mean that just because we're talking about how heavy the puppets were but like there's a density and a weight to real effects that you just can't achieve like even the best version of the Hulk that we've seen so far still kind of looks like he's floating. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. And I mean, part of the challenge is that a giant green uh, muscle guy is not something that we see in real life. It's not? It's not. I mean, <laughs> maybe in your, the circles. <laughs> Only you might on cans in, of green beans. You got to yeah. go to Muscle Beach more often, <laughs> I <friend>. guess, I <laughs> guess. Um, No, but the, the idea being that these are things that we don't see in real life, so we're automatically mm-hmm. our brains are ready to not really believe what we're seeing just as an instinctual thing so having them actually be physical material objects i think helps with our perception of them on the screen but the other thing i was thinking with the even with traditional puppetry so they used a lot of radio controlled um, electronics in the faces to get the subtle movements that they needed in the movie, like the Ninja Turtles. Well, yeah, I was, which I think it. people might be maybe more familiar with. Sure, totally. Mm-hmm. Um, but the way the technology has moved forward is, I think that is conceived in a very different way, and I think we're going to see it in the um, the show. Mm-hmm. How it's the same idea that they're using electronics to for facial expressions, but the electronics they're using obviously are 21st century as opposed to. 20th century. Yeah. I, I would imagine now, and this is me uh, not being a, an advanced 21st century puppeteer, I would imagine I, now no? I'm not. <laughs> if any uh, uh, advanced puppeteers are listening, please email us uh, geekisrealson at gmail.com. We'll, we'll have to talk to you. <laughs> we'll, we'll have you on the show. Come on. Um, correct everything that we've just yes. discussed. Yeah, yeah, that's I, would, I would imagine now, because there's a, there's a thing now where, you know, when you're doing a lot of CGI shots on a film set or a TV set, you can program the camera to where the camera does the same move every single time so it fits the special effect. I would imagine this puppetry 
is probably the same thing. I imagine that they, you know, there's, I bet you there's sometimes that the oh, operator think? is actually operating, but I bet you they program it and it runs the same way every time. So that they could, could use have. algorithms yes. for certain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. You know? That and um, they could actually potentially use motion capture. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, or they could use CG to touch up anything or, or enhance. Because that would be what a thing where you approve the, you perfor- you approve the performance before you shoot it. Mm-hmm. You know? oh. Right, you perfect it. Yeah, um, they did say that they they used <laughs> <blown> um, <laughs> the green screens to uh, uh, CGI out the puppeteers. Yeah, mm-hmm. which I imagine is much easier than what they were doing on the original movie. <laughs> well, and it's funny. I was actually um, rewatching the movie and thinking about these moments. Um, I read a comment where what you the the frame you see on the screen. There's so many. Um, puppeteers below below the frame, outside the frame, just um, monitors and things. They were monitors inside the costume so the puppeteers mm-hmm. could see what they were doing mm-hmm. and how their performances. Can you um, imagine? Because you're like self-conscious enough as an actor to begin with, but then to have to watch your own performance and correct on the well, fly. Well, because otherwise they can't tell what the puppet's doing. I mean, right. I understand, yeah, yeah, yeah. but like the... And that's why the, it's true the, acting. The mm-hmm. mind trip of that must have be you, incredible. You should, if anybody hasn't done it, you should go Google. There are pictures of Yoda on Empire Strikes Back. And if you see the swamp set, it's so interesting because it's all built like uh, 10 uh, feet oh, off oh, the yeah, floor. Yeah, yeah. And then when you see the wide shot of it, so the top looks like the swamp swamp and there's actually water up there and there's like weird <laughs> muck and stuff and then the wide shot is it's you know just like plywood and boards and you see like Frank Oz laying on a, just a piece of plywood looking at a little TV monitor with his hand up in the ceiling <laughs> <laughs> fantastic it's truly that's movie magic <laughs> it is and they didn't have the opportunity to just green screen out any of those things so yeah. they had to build those sets and it had to be practical kind of yeah um a couple more facts. One that I love is Henson hired a French mime to help the actors to um, with movements. And I things. love I love that so much. <laughs> well, the, so this so this person found out that one of the actors that they had hired um, was uh, a stilt walker. And there's these creatures called land striders in the movie, which are these tall, they have really long legs, four legs. They're kind of a cross between a horse um, and they kind of look like rats. Oh, I've or seen like the mice. toys of those. Yeah. yeah. So they got whiskers and stuff and they got I really, really cute. Um, but the reason that they were born in that form was because this um, French mime that Henson had on set discovered somebody was a stilt walker and then um, more people on set could could do the stilt walking. So the the um, actors inside these land striders are on these stilts and it was only because on set somebody had this experience with these stilts and that's how these, these creatures were actually created um, to be in the movie, which I think is cool as heck. <laughs> um, so they did some test footage of the mystics and Henson was really unsure if this was all going to work. And so they did some test footage uh, and they, sh- he rented out, he didn't do it in a screening room. He rented out a theater in London um, and had the, had the crew there. Cause they it. shot this in London, right? Yeah. Yeah. At Pinewood, do we know? If we don't know, it's fine. I, I can't remember. I can literally Google it really one, easily. One would assume. Pinewood is you, yeah. the only English studio that any Americans know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, so, this, so we rented out an actual theater, though. Uh, and I guess there was a collective sigh of relief in the, in the theater when they saw this test footage uh, because it actually was working. But Henson had this one idea that didn't make it into the final movie, which is he believed that he wanted the Skeksis and the um, mystics to have their own language. Mm. And he didn't want to use subtitles because he believed that the visuals could carry the movie. And so after he did the first cut and they did a test showing, um, audiences were baffled. Nobody knew what was happening. And I guess Henson was devastated. Um, Look, I admire that Jim, Mr. Henson... Wanted to try that idea. I think it's a bad idea. No, well, he, he found out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just I think one, you're already asking your audience to give up a suspension of disbelief because they're puppets, and you're asking them to believe that these puppets are living creatures. And I think to ask them to jump over another hoop of language 
is one step too far. And I think that's what yeah. the conversation was back mm-hmm. then. Well, even in Lord of the Rings, right, we see Elvish for maybe maybe eight lines in the whole movie, in mm-hmm. each movie. like. But you get subtitles with those. You though. do, but like, yeah, foreign languages. The best one I Not can, foreign, completely fictional languages. The, the are mo- a tough bar for entry. For, uh, the modern example of that that I can think of is that there are scenes in Cloud Atlas, that Wachowski Brothers movie, where they have the right. scene in the future, and it's because uh, humanity has sort of turned more into like cavemen that they talk in this sort of English gibberish. And you can mostly understand it. Like, you can get it. It's kind of like Deadwood. If you listen to it enough, you'll get it. But it's still pretty confusing in some points where you're like, I don't know what they're saying. So, I, well, yeah. we've had also, you know, almost 40 years of uh, movies since mm-hmm. then. So, audiences really have seen almost everything. The audiences are way more intelligent now, yeah. They right. shot at L Street Studios, if anyone was tracking that question or cares, which is still around. Yeah, so so uh, it turned out that the audiences hated it, so they went back and uh, redubbed the movie, and uh, the screenwriter wrote dialogue based on the edit that existed. So in the movie, oh. I actually I have no basis other than just you know inferring this from that whole scenario is when you watch the movie, there is a lot of moments when Jen is just walking around and there's this inner monologue that's spoken ah. and i have to, i think that was the result of him walking around with no dialogue at first and then having to go back and redub the whole thing but another interesting fact about dubbing um because there were the voices were all going to be all different the um like frank oz and henson weren't voicing any of the characters mm-hmm. they could actually be noisy on set so apparently oh. At times, Henson would call out and say, move this way or do this thing um, while they were shooting. And it was fine because they knew they'd have to go back in and dub the whole audio over top uh, of it. I uh, would kill. It wouldn't it be amazing to see that like, original footage and hear what they were saying. Frank, can you turn your head a little <laughs> bit over there? Yeah. Thanks, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, right. even just for like five, like that would be incredible to be. What? Jerry, lift your arm up a little bit there, nope, Jerry. Nobody's <laughs> shouting quiet on set at you. <laughs> and the, the last fact that I will um, add here is that. Uh, he had a financier come in to help with the budget on the film, and they had a really, I guess they really saw eye to eye um, creatively. But then that financier was uh, bought out of the of his company, mm-hmm. and a new person came in who was a venture capitalist who didn't care really about the creative aspects, just wanted to, um, you know, make money, make <laughs> yeah. money. Um, and Henson did not get along with him at all, and eventually Henson went back and paid him. $15 million of his own money to get the film back. It still had, um, I think it was Paramount was doing the, um, did the distribution. Mm-hmm. And uh, so Paramount was still doing the dis- distribution, but Henson put out $15 million of his own money on this movie to get it back. So he had a lot riding on this movie. I kind of respect that. Yeah. I really do. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you have the money. To yeah, of course. I mean, you know, I, you know, I, my $15 million is it in the bank. Where's yours? Yeah. yeah. I, have, I would have to post date the check to about uh, 2,200. Yeah. Um, but the budget was about 25 million and uh, the domestic box office was 41 million. And um, I think internet or uh, worldwide, it got up to about 60 million. Uh, and it was competing that weekend with Tootsie, I think. Ooh. Oh, is that why you made that Tootsie joke earlier? Uh, maybe, maybe. <laughs> Foreshadowing. And then um, it was, E.T. was also still out in the theaters Ooh. by then. Yeah. And um, it, tough, tough. Dark Crystal came out to mixed reviews, but it did win the best film at the French Avery Fantastic Film Festival and won a Saturn Award for the best fantasy film f- uh, from the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films. And it was competing against the likes of E.T. and Blade Runner. So I think Kenson might have had the last. Yeah. It does It does um, feel like something that would have, would hit with a French audience. It feels like a very French sensibility. Well, they, uh, you know, it was, it, I think it was more, it was clicking more with the um, core sci fi fantasy. Mm-hmm fan base than it was general audiences and i think it's unfortunate because he tried to do something creative and new and push forward and nowadays that's all that we want Mm -hmm. as audiences we want to see filmmakers do is do something new and different and you know push forward with what you've done and i think back then the audiences you know when he gets a question where are the muppets Mm -hmm. 
it's just it's kind of unfortunate that it it was there you know he was doing something so wonderful and groundbreaking and the audience kept saying well just keep doing you know we want to see what you've been doing Mm -hmm. this whole time um so of course he went on to make labyrinth which um i don't know really a whole lot about how successful labyrinth was but we know of course it's a cult classic now yeah um at the time of this recording the in la they have an event called the labyrinth of jareth every year it was friday town yeah it just happened david so. bowie showed up <laughs> i mean i'm sure <laughs> i'm sure hands. his spirit was there yes <laughs> there were a lot of people who i'm sure were dressed up like david bowie yeah. in those super tight pants with the awkward you know like david bowie fits everything. in with puppets for me i'm just saying like you know oh. that, that man was a god and 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 God Among Puppets. Truly. <laughs> and also right after this, his uh, Henson's very next um, project was um, getting Fraggle Rock off the ground. Oh, they, bless. Now an HBO show. So, <laughs> which it, was, it went to HBO. So they were shopping around and he was super confident that he was going to set it up. Mm-hmm. And HBO eventually picked it up. And it's so funny because they were thinking... I don't know. It's like a subscription service back then in 1983 mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, it still kind of is. <laughs> but they were super, well, it is, but they were super aggressive about how they wanted to grow and they wanted to do original content. And it sounds very similar to mm-hmm. another subscription based, uh, <laughs> you know, service that's out there making original content now. So it's funny. Um, to me, I've always seen Fraggle Rock and the Dark Crystal as connected. Like they seem like shared universe, if well, you will. Almost, they, they almost seem like they're the opposite sides of the same coin. Like to me, I don't think you get Fraggle Rock without the Dark Crystal. Like the dark. Like, I think that's fair. Like Fraggle Rock looks like the happy, cartoony characters that live in the Dark Crystal world. You know, like I think you're yeah. totally right. Yeah, because I think he became, um, he became more than he was the Muppets guy, mm-hmm. and I think he became more. Of a, a puppet filmmaker mm-hmm. after Dark Crystal, mm-hmm. because otherwise it was just going to be Kermit and Miss Piggy yes. all the time. And and by the end of the eighties, the Muppets were kind of done, and they've sort of never recovered from that either. Now a little bit of that might have been because Jim Henson got sick, mm-hmm. but I don't know. The Muppets have never. Although the Muppet ba- there's a Muppet Babies that's animated true. show that's that's on right now. That oh, I guess is we yes. have successful. the Kermit action figure that was part of that show. <laughs> <laughs> I watched Muppet Babies when I, I was did too. Young, yeah, that was the most addictive I, theme song of all time. Oh my god, I loved it <laughs> so much. Talk about an earworm. Yes. Um, but I also think too, uh, Dark Crystal. I think also leads us to, and Ashley, you brought this up earlier. I think one of the greatest Good achievements of the Jim Henson Company is the Teenage Mutant. Ninja Turtle suits. Oh, yeah. Those heads and the way they talk are so amazing. And I'd be honest with you, I still think the first movie, I think the second and the third movie, I think the second and third movie, I don't think they used Henson. They or they didn't. went. They and went you can, movie. you oh. can. These are the 90s? The, oh, yeah, the, ni- the, the, the 1990 Teenage Mutant Ninja right. Turtle movie um, was the Henson Secret Company. Secret of the U's, right? Or is that the No, sequel? that's the that's sequel. The sec- and then third one is uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Three. There's, back in the habit? No, sir. Yeah, you want to you yeah. call it back <laughs> Turtle in Turtle harder. <laughs> it's basically Turtles in Japan, but it doesn't work. But the first one, they used Henson, and the suits look great. They were animatronic, and I'm going to blow everybody's mind right now. Go back and still frame or look for still pictures, because the way the actors wore those suits, their eyes are inside their mouths, and you can see the yeah. actor's eyes yeah, yeah, yeah. inside their mouths. But... <laughs> I still think I showed Ashley this film a couple years ago. I still think the first Turtles mostly holds up, mm-hmm. and those suits still look great. They look if like you, real people. If you're just casually watching it, though, do you see the oh, eyeballs? No, 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 no. You have to freeze oh, it. You okay. have to freeze it. It's just like the sur- like, that's weird. <laughs> you know, this turtle faces well, you know, open like, and it's got eyes in the. Well, mouth. you know, they look like that Beetlejuice lady. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> totally. like, where a human opens your mouth and you see the uvula and the black hole yes. down to the stomach. That's where for you, turtles, it's eyeballs. For turtles, it's, it's a human. <laughs> I mean, they're mutants, so why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so the time has come, Ashley. The Dark Crystal, mm-hmm. based on the evidence presented by our prosecutor, David. Yes. <laughs> would you watch this movie? So I'm going to be completely honest. Up until this point in my life, I've never ever considered watching The Dark Crystal, um, but I love mythology, and that's what you. St- Started with so within the first ten minutes, I was like, "Damn it! Now I gotta watch the Dark Crystal." <laughs> so maybe we'll watch it uh, when we go out of town. But yeah, I'm definitely gonna watch it, and I'm definitely gonna. I feel like now it's recommended, required reading, viewing before the show comes out. How about I you? I agree. Um, I'm gonna rewatch it. Yeah, 
Yeah, you want to? Yeah, well, I, I, I always was going to rewatch. I was always going to watch the new Netflix show because I knew it was a prequel. Um, I was undecided about whether I was going to rewatch the original film, but uh, thanks to your amazing you know, lesson here. (laughs) Um, Now that I know how much Jim Henson blood, sweat and tears was poured into this. And I love everything Jim Henson. I feel like I, 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 it's it's a required rewatch now. Yeah. I'll I'll just add two things. If if you're on the fence, one is um, he stuck so uh, doggedly to his creative vision for this film that no matter what happened and no matter how many people came and said, what do you, why aren't, where's Kermit? Um, he was he stuck with it and he made this movie and it's and I think that um, says a lot in itself. I know you keep joking about that, but I, I swear to God, like for some reason in my head, I, I bet people literally walked on a set and was like where, and said that line. Where's well, yeah, Kermit? It was the press. Yeah, it was the press that when he would talk to them, he said he he would have to explain to them. Well, this is the, the these are puppets, but this is a brand new world mm-hmm. with new and different story. And they had, he'd have to start with that before he could even talk about what the substance of the movie was. But also. What a nice problem to have that people love your original thing so much that they still want to see more of it. Like, I would, I'll take on that problem if yeah, someone wants to throw it my way. Me too. <laughs> and then the other thing is, um, there are so many tiny details in this movie that they, um, there, there is a scene, my favorite scene in the whole movie is uh, this panning of a, a swamp. And there's, these little lizard creatures that run by, these twirly things that go up in the air. There's like a tr- tree roots that walk away. There's this hill that then eats. It looks like a hill, but it closes its mouth and eats something. Um, the, every, the plants are like moving a little bit. And every single little thing they had to design as a puppet. Mm-hmm. And they had to have somebody working it as this camera was panning across this, this, this swamp set. And just to watch those little details throughout this movie is absolutely just stunning to see how they created this world that was so immersive and so much work and thought had gone into um, building it from, the, from scratch, from the ground up, that if for nothing else, if you don't get drawn by the story, just you know, watch for the details and everything that they did. Awesome. Well, as you know, we've already mentioned this before in the recommended reading section. Ashley, what's that? Recommended reading is where if you were moved by this lesson and you want to know more, you go to geekhistorylesson.com slash recommended reading. You click on the thing you like, you buy it in your preferred form, and a little bit of support comes back our way so that I can keep FizzGeek in his cage here at the Mind University. That's right. Uh, So, of course, the Dark Crystal movie will be there. The Dark Crystal art book will be there. But also a little book called Canto will be there. Mr. David, uh, you need you just, canto, canto, canto. <laughs> you just told us a little bit about this whole big fantasy world, but you've been writing and creating your own fantasy world in Canto. This Is it six issues or five issues? I forget. It's going to be six issues, and we're about how, actually, by the time this, this is going to air next week. This will right? literally come out tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> well, tomorrow is Monday, which means the time that recording. <laughs> issues, issues one, two, and three are going to be on shelves on Wednesday. Um, reprints for first uh, and second issues, and the third issue will be brand new on Wednesday. Uh, it's a six-issue arc. It's very much inspired by um, me and my co-creator, Drew Zucker, and the artist, our love for dark fantasy from the 80s so dark crystal is the very it top of that feels like a very dark crystal i see a it's lot of dark very, crystal influences in this in labyrinth Kanto. um never ending story just that the fantasy that doesn't that didn't um back then that didn't pull punches and that didn't um pull up because it was going to be for kids yeah um it's an all-ages book but you know there is there is an edge of darkness to it so it's about this um this race of little we call them little tin people uh but they're they're basically like hobbit sized, and they look like a cross between knights and um, little robot. They're steampunky so robots. Cute. Um, I love and it's them. hard, you know, it's hard <laughs> without the visuals because the visuals are so um, integral to the story. Um, but Kanto is one of these little creatures, and his people are enslaved, and they don't know why. They just keep working to feed these furnaces. They they're not allowed to have names. They're not allowed to tell stories. They're not allowed to care for one another. When they're taken, they have real hearts, and their hearts are removed and replaced with clocks. So when their time is up or their clocks get damaged, they go into the furnaces. So Kanto, he has a name, and he defies all of this. He's in love with a little tin girl. 
and her clock gets damaged beyond repair. And so he discovers that he has to go out into his great big fantastical world to find out where they take their hearts to bring hers back to save her. So I like to say it's sort of a, a dark, there's a darkness in the world and Canto is sort of the light and the courage and the hope going forward to on this great, huge adventure to save somebody that he really cares about. And we were talking right early, earlier about the ticking clock. You've literally put the ticking clock inside <laughs> your character. Yeah. We're wearing our hearts on our sleeves and we have a ticking clock, right? Um, yeah, and so one of the things that we wanted to do is sort of in contrast with the Dark Crystal is the Dark Crystal opens with a lot of backstory and they create this scenario where all this mythology has led to this moment. And in Kanto, we didn't front load really any of the backstory because these little tin characters, they don't know any of it. They don't know anything but what's in front of them. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to give um, Kanto a very urgent, forward-looking um, quest that didn't have necessarily to do with saving the world, but very personal to save somebody he cares about in defiance of everything that they've ever known. And so as we go along, there's a lot of depth to it. There's going to be a lot of um, you know building out of the world. But for this arc... You, as a reader, and this is some of the feedback that we've been getting. As a reader, you can just jump on board, and you're not, you're not, you're not drinking out of the fire hose when it comes to understanding the world. Yeah, you just go along this adventure, and as he learns about who his people are and what this world is, you will learn about it too. Well, I just want to say this. Yeah, the art is by Drew Zucker. It's quite amazing. It's quite astounding. Um, I love all you guys. You guys have had some amazing variant covers, like Nick Robles did one of your variant covers. I think, didn't you just announce Phil Seavey is going to do one as well? Yeah, so Phil Seavey, we got um, uh, Ben Bishop, who mm -hmm. is a yes. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle artist. Um, Coming back to the Turtles. Great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jorge Corona. Um, if, if for Middle the, West, yes. For, yes, great for book. The, mm -hmm. For the comics fans out there, Middle West has been uh, incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, and then and then we've got one cover coming out. That you can't um, say yet. The, on issue six, that I think uh, your people's it's going to be the end of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and everybody's faces are just going to melt. <laughs> Let's just. Um, so I have been. I am a Comicsology subscriber to Canto right now. Uh, so I am just going to say that I fully endorse this book. I've loved all the issues, and David is exactly right. It is. So accessible. It's so easy to read. It's a lot of fun. I'm very curious where you're going with the book because I've been poking David for spoilers and he will not tell me. Um, so Yeah, because uh, David is also a good friend of ours. So we've known that Kanto was in the hopper for a minute. Mm -hmm. And it's been really exciting to watch it unfold and to see that everybody loves it. <laughs> so you should go to your comic book shop right now and you should go pick up the first three issues of Kanto and you should pre-order issue four, issue five, issue six. Issue six apparently is going to have this amazing variant cover. She pre-ordered two of those. And it's going to have um, a surprise. If you think you know where the story is going, you don't. Let me. So I'm going to ask you the question now that I bet some people have been asking you with the success of this book. Is Kanto a one and done is there a possibility for a sequel or even a prequel going Dark Crystal way? Yeah. Perhaps, Jason. No, look at this. <laughs> see, see uh, this is why David is an amazing lawyer. He avoids the question <laughs> yeah, yeah. at every turn. <laughs> this is someone um, with nothing there but respect are, for his NDAs. <laughs> I, 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 I would say, I would tell readers that there is reason for optimism. Okay. And that you would love to do one, I'm sure. Oh, I would yeah. love to do it. So go to your comic book shop, pre-order. Uh, it's also available on Comixology. Are there any other places that you think they should check out Kanto or you prefer they check out Kanto? or? Um, Comic shops are the best place. Okay. Um, once all six issues uh, come out, then we're going to collect them in a volume, and that's what you'll be able to pick up at Barnes and Noble. And mm, yeah, we'll on have. Amazon. A, we also will have a link for the trade as well because it's already on Amazon. Which it's already on Amazon. Mm -hmm. So if you want to um, get on board early, mm -hmm. that's you, you can pre-orders make your books, kids. Like even a trade uh, is the same for our book, my book, Super Soldiers. Like yeah, pre-orders are a big deal. So if that's the way you want to support, you want to get all and done in one, go click that pre-order button like right now because it will actually help David as we say it's a great book it's a really really great book all right so really quickly we're going to move into the last section of our podcast uh David the last section of our podcast is on a roll where we get people on our 
Apple Podcasts to leave us five star reviews, and then we read them on the podcast right now. So this you, sh- you should read the one star reviews. Oh no, we don't want to give them any type of uh, those. I'm going to feed the trolls. Right? I'm going to steal a joke from the Blank Check podcast and say that those people are Sith lords, and we will have no part of Sith lords on this podcast. <laughs> so uh, the first one comes from Toast Sage Lucas, who says, "I watch the Jawan YouTube channel all the time. Thank you, and was looking into more comic book themed podcasts. A friend recommended GHL to me, and I was delighted to find out that it was." Basically, the Jawan podcast. Yeah. I enjoy the discussion episodes the most, and I was hoping that they do a lesson on wars like a lot of my history classes, maybe a lesson on Marvel Civil War. Yeah, there's a possibility in that. The next one comes from Best Hype Man Ever. He says, great and informative information. Just pick this one up. Listen to Mega Man because, well, Mega Man! Yeah. With uh, five exclamation points. You guys do a great synopsis on things that so many people care about for absolutely no good reason. <laughs> nice job, guys. Well, Toast Sage Lucas and Best Hype Hype man ever welcome into the teacher's lounge. Uh, there are a there's a jar of Twizzlers in the corner. Uh, do you know who brought those in? Uh, David brought those in. Oh, that's like, what does David teach at the Mind University? David teaches fantasy dark as hell literature. I love it. At the Mind <laughs> University, as we've just learned. Uh, don't forget, guys, you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, all those places, Spotify, iHeartRadio, blah, 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 blah. Everywhere you can put a podcast in your ear holes, it's there. Don't forget to support this podcast on Patreon at patreon.com slash Jawan because we do an extra episode. Geek History is an extra. Today, it's going to be more with David. More with Dave. We're going to talk about lots of cool stuff. Also, there's it's not just podcasts over there, guys. Uh, very soon, I'm going to be releasing a, a little taste of my comic over there, Super Best Friend, that you can only read on Patreon. So you definitely want to do that. David, they want to follow you on Twitter and all the places around. Where are the best places to do that? Well, Twitter, I'm at David Boer. Uh, Instagram is at David M. Boer. And if you're uh, intrigued by Kanto, you can follow Kanto on Instagram at at Kanto Comic. I do. Yeah, they have a lot of cool Instagram stories over there, so you should go check that out. Don't forget to follow us at GHL Podcast. You can follow me on Twitter at J-A-W-I-I-N and Ashley on Twitter at Ashley V. Robinson. Hashtag stick around. The last part of the podcast and make sure you stick through all the plugs. David, question for you. The new Netflix series, The Dark Crystal Age of Resistance? Yes. Will you be binging it or will you be watching it an episode at the time i will probably binge it but it does come out um when i will be backpacking through the high sierras with no internet access at all so it will have to wait until i get back so probably for your benefit better stay off twitter (laughs) i know no spoiler i I do know you know they eventually all die at the end so yeah yeah Yeah, it's not true the dark crystal movie is the spoilers for this show that's true (laughs) i mean they're not going to suddenly like twist it around like unless unless this is like star trek 2009 they create a prime dark crystal (laughs) timeline I would like to see uh, the show that set way into the future where the Gelfling have reestablished and there's some new big bat that's coming in. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. They, w- well, they didn't the, ask me. So Net- what do Netflix I know? Netflix can hire David at any time to show that's that. That's season two uh, <laughs> the, called The Age of Harmony. Well, uh-huh. wouldn't that be cool, though, if they did an anthology series where it was just one season and different aspects of this yes. universe? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You could hop all over this universe, I think. All right, cool. Thank you so much for joining us. David, thank you so much for joining us on oh. Geek History Lesson and teaching us about Dark Crystal. Oh, it's been my pleasure. What a fun time. All right, everybody, that has been Geek History Lesson. I have been Jason Crystallized Inman. I have been Ashley Victoria Robinson and Professor Jason, will you please dismiss the class? Class is dismissed. <laughs>